Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. All right, we are back for another episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight, we have a distinguished panel uh, of excellent guests, uh, Don Gray has returned. Don, how are you tonight? Very well, thank you, sir. Great to have you back. Amitai Schleier, a show regular, a huge favorite, actually. Amitai recently got some very nice Twitter love from a number of listeners uh, for his brilliance with, I believe, Mr. Arlo Belshi on that episode. Amitai, you're now famous. Uh, it's simply by being able to keep up with Arlo sometimes. I'm not famous. <laughs> very well done. And I'm very excited tonight about our, our third guest who's uh, graciously decided to join us. She is one of my favorite Agile authors, uh, Esther Derby. How are you tonight? I'm great, thanks. And I'm really so, happy to be here. And we're so excited you de- decided to join us. Over the past 16, 17 episodes, we seem to be stumbling onto a common topic, and that is trust. Whether we're talking about management, teams, uh, retrospectives, all of these agile concepts, we keep weaving in and out of the idea that, that trust is foundational. And at one point, Don threw his hands up and said, why are we doing this? We should have Esther on and just get trust covered. And I could not agree more. And so through um, connections and conversations and, and Esther, you being generous with your time, which we truly appreciate, I think we're going to finally have the trust episode. That sounds good with everyone else. Well, it sounds good to me, but as you know, I already told you about another person you have to talk about when you talk about trust, so so it's not over yet. (laughs) Let's hope it's a nice kickoff to many more conversations about this, I think, very critical, uh, misunderstood, and underappreciated topic within our our field of work. I I think it's misunderstood in the whole work world in general. So where do you think that disconnect is, Esther? I think that's a that's a good place to start, just the whole disconnect of trust in the whole work world. Why do you think that that tends to play out that way? Well, I, I think there's a couple of of historical factors that play into it, one of which is that um, traditionally, um, you know, organizations are are designed in a sort of mechanistic way. Um, which doesn't uh, allow for a lot of humanity. And um, if you look back at the origins of management, it really was about exacting maximum effort um, from people with a clear separation of head and hands. And that's a situation that, you know, is inherently one that is, holds one set of people in less regard. And it's hard to have trust in that sort of situation. So it seems like in those situations where they've separated head and hand, what you see predominantly happening is the application of process to people. And in that instance, I wonder if management feels trust isn't required because they can control the steps that each person is taking. Well, I think that's, I think that is part of the design of many of the procedure and manuals we see in many of the policy books we come across where if we specify everything then people won't make stupid and foolish mistakes <laughs> but then we also find that absolutely no system is foolproof <laughs> yes and so a, a vicious cycle occurs right well and and what what the other thing that happens is that because there are so many rules the only way to actually get anything done is by breaking rules 
which further damages the trust dynamic in the organization. You know, on one hand, there's the message that, you know, the people who are with with good intentions coming up with policies and procedures don't trust us to make decisions. And on the other hand, to get anything done, you have to break rules, which, you know, then you have to kind of hide it. And that further erodes the trust dynamic. So as an Agile coach, and I, I think Amitai and Don and Esther, the three of you, when you decide to go into an organization, whether on the, in, in the initial meeting or subsequent visits, trust is probably at zero, and yet you're supposed to be able to come in and be effective. And so do you find that there are ways that initially coaches can establish trust and, and get that kind of relationship going that you have found success with that... Uh, or is that even an issue at the initial part of, of the engagement? Oh, I think it's always an issue. It, it, and we've, we've often been told that we, trust has to be earned, but I think it's exactly the opposite. If you want to establish a trusting environment and you want to build trust with another person, you have to give trust. You have to extend trust. And in part, that is in saying, you know, I trust that these people are doing the best they can, given where they're coming from and the structures they live and work in and what they've known up until now. Um, And I think that's a really crucial piece of trust to start from. About Don and Amitai, any trust experiences starting out with clients and and some of the the struggles and and challenges you've had to overcome? I sort of naively stumbled on the same strategy. I can't say it was always a strategy. Uh, And even now, when I'm not paying attention, it's just what I do by default, which I think is why uh, I have sort of an average effectiveness that surprises me, (laughs) is that uh, through whatever luck of the draw of how I was raised and uh, the kinds of jobs I grew up in and the management styles I learned from and uh, learned to not mimic and learn to do better than and then learn from, from people who are good at it, I seem to be the kind of person, based on observing my own behavior and other people's observations of my behavior, that is trusting by default. And that's why I say it's not necessarily a strategy. Uh, I just kind of lean on that. I kind of behave that way. I'm used to what happens when sometimes that turns out not to be smart, and it hasn't convinced me to stop doing it that way. Mm-hmm. I, have to, I have to be convinced with interactions with a particular person in a particular situation to stop doing that. And it's hard for me. It's something that I'm not good at, is stopping trusting. So uh, I, don't know that it's a, I don't know that it's a strategy that I follow. It's just a thing that I do because of the way that I am. But I can say that it definitely earns trust. I support that. For me, it, it comes to more, it, it's similar to Amitai, but it's, it's a little more fundamental for me, is my fundamental assumption of people. Uh, Esther was talking about managers, uh, the history of management being one where their goal was to extract uh, maximum value out of the worker and that workers would slack off if they weren't uh, motivated, externally motivated, watched, punished. Um, My basic assumption is people are good, people want to do good, and people will do good. And so with that fundamental assumption, it's very, trust isn't even really an issue to speak of for me in that I'm assuming they're going to do the good thing. They're going to do the right thing. And then like Amitai, once in a great while, once in a very great while, you will find somebody who goes, well, no, I'm really not that way. And, And they have to demonstrate that they're not capable of behaving uh, in, in, in meeting my fundamental assumption. And then I have to adjust my behavior accordingly. But Don, I think your strategy r- actually rises to the level of one as opposed to mine because part of what makes people behave the way that you expect is that your expectation helps them do that. Would you agree with that? I think that's absolutely true. But it's not something – I don't walk into a new team and look at the team and go, hey, team. I expect you guys to excel and be super and we'll just, we'll become agile and we'll do scrum and it will be holding hands and rainbows and unicorns. It's, I think it's something people sense. It's, it's a, some, somehow we uh, carry ourselves, we comport ourselves in such a way that it's, it's just an assumption on my part and it shows somehow. I don't know how. 
Well, I suspect it shows because you don't come in and tell people how to do things immediately. You watch, you listen, you ask questions, you try to find out, um, you know, what their history is, what their story is, what their challenges are, which is a basic part of respect. But it also conveys that you, you, you trust that they are competent people who are capable of solving problems and maybe are just a little stuck on the current problem. So maybe we can say that the first thing that we do, sorry to jump in, the first thing that we do okay. in impacting an environment is to is our, our conveyance of our perception of the people we're working with, which may immediately already be 100% different from the perceptions we're used to. Right, right. Um, th- I think the other thing that people get really um, tangled up with in trust is that they sort of assume that trust is an on or off switch, that you either completely trust someone or you completely don't trust someone. And I think for for functioning adults, it's really far more contextual than that, and it's far more bounded than that. One of the examples I give is I, I I trust my husband with my life, but I don't trust him with my laundry. You know, I mean, there's always a boundary around it. Has he killed laundry in the past? I have imposed a laundry ruination fee a time or two, yes. You know, you shrink one sweater, <laughs> all of a sudden no one trusts you. And it's just unfair, I think. So I'm under strict orders in my home as well when it comes to laundry. So... You know, I wonder, too, management is especially interesting to me. I Many years ago, I, I took the leap from developer to management and always have had some mixed feelings about it. I've tried to bring agile principles into a non-agile world and still manage in a way that's respectful to people. And what I found initially is that the questions and the seeking to understand, I think, as you guys were talking through, is important, even for an internal employee. Yeah. To, to express that kind of behavior. I trust people who follow through. <coughs> So there's also that aspect to it that you can listen, but at the same time, if you don't follow through with action, that trust erodes as well. And I, and I find that to be the critical next step is when you walk into a situation, you listen, you evaluate, you observe, you're not directing, you're not disrespecting, but at the same time, when it comes time to do what you've, you've said, failing to do so can actually flip that off switch with some mm. people. Yeah. I mean, that's, Actually, Mark Bergauer, who I mentioned a little earlier, if not by name, um, he goes by at some sheep on Twitter. Um, he talks about trust as an outcome. And and from that standpoint, it is about following through on commitments. However, in a lot of organizational settings, I find that people have every intention or every desire to follow through on a commitment or take an action. But there are so many structural elements working um, in an opposite direction that I I don't necessarily flip that bit on people, you know, if they don't follow through on actions. You know, yeah. I try to figure out what else might be true in the context that um, that is a part of that behavior. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I typically find that when there are those situations that a system has failed somebody, and yeah. it's it's interesting to walk back through, you know, what happened outside of the situation and within that system that actually caused that breakdown and, and how can that actually be replaced. And so I think you're right. It's very contextual. I was more speaking to when it's just a flat out, you know, said something, did another. And that's probably the easiest way for management, at least, to destroy any kind of trust with employees. It's already an adversarial relationship can in be. so many ways, right? You have... Um, a traditional corporation, the way that they behave, really, I think it can get uh, to that kind of level, especially when you have, you know, typically it's lack of transparency in certain areas. It's a lot of closed door meetings. It's, yeah. uh, we can't talk about this particular topic, but you're welcome to ask about that topic kind of things. And, and with the, the situation already being that, it's just so delicate trying to foster that or spark that trust, at least in my own experience. Yeah. Well, I think part of part of that dynamic is that with every good intention, you know, people in the organization talk about their values and they talk about, you know, 
you know, we believe and we value our employees and we are built on trust and all this other stuff. And then the actions don't match that. And when the actions and the words don't match, that gap fills up with cynicism and fear. And neither of those are conducive to trust. When it comes to, maybe we can loop this back to an agile environment. When you see companies doing an agile transformation and they're trying to make these initial first steps, do you guys start with those social aspects such as trust or are you getting into the practices and inherently through the practices and the ceremony and the agile processes, you're hoping that trust is built? I think you have to work on both. And you have to work on the systems, the upstream systems that, I'm thinking about how I want to say this, where managers make decisions about what should be done and then expect other people to be accountable to do that. And it's not actually a process where there is a peer-to-peer agreement. It's more of top-down, you will do this. And that gets in the way of trust. But Amitai, it looks like you're thinking a little bit that that's jumbling around and resonating. What's going on in that brain? Let it out. Well, I was wondering whether I want to get Esther's husband in trouble and ask, you know, what kinds of trust lessons could we learn from the laundry experience? Ooh. You know, what did you try to help him make better decisions about laundry? Uh, what contributed to your short fuse about it? Anything along those lines, if you want to talk about it. <laughs> wow. So you, you, you literally want her to air her dirty laundry on a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it's my husband who's going to be in trouble if I talk about that. I think it's going to be me. I'll, I'll talk about mine because I, I actually did shrink a sweater. I, was, I wasn't making a joke there. I actually I destroyed one of my wife's favorite sweaters. And, and it's really along the lines of what Esther was saying. I had the best of intentions. Absolutely. I wanted to get a load of laundry done before she got home from work and try to get something that normally would would keep her up. She's very list oriented and she's very driven. She has a motor that doesn't quit. And so if there's something on the list, it has to get done before she can relax. And so my intention was, I'm going to knock out a few things that I know she wants to get done. So I did a few other things around the house, got to laundry. I'm horrible at laundry. I have no business doing laundry, but I thought, all right, this can't be that hard. And so I was, (laughs) right. So that's mistake number one. I hear something go a thing before a fall right about now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, grabbed a sweater, grabbed a bunch of other stuff that didn't go together. You know, our our washer and dryer, the machines look like rocket ships. There's so many buttons on it that it, you know, permanent press versus a a cotton or what. I don't know what any of that stuff means. I'm not educated in such things. But I, I went with the if you wash everything in cold, you can't go wrong kind of tactic. And uh, so a typical bachelor, you know, reach back to my single days and just wash it all in cold and dry it on high heat and you'll be fine. Right? <laughs> and, uh, there it is. And hey, at least I'm washing stuff now. Back then you just throw it in the dryer, throw a little Febreze in there and, and go on with your day. But, but yeah, so I just, I went to do that with the best of intentions, thinking we'd have an enjoyable evening and we could, you know, Not- spend time with the kids. And I destroyed that sweater and she was devastated for a moment. It is a sweater. But to her credit, she did extend grace in that instance where she was appreciative of the effort, irritated with the outcome, gave some guidance for the future, <laughs> which is don't ever touch my clothes again. And, uh, and we moved on from it. So, but the lesson there was I didn't respect the work. I wasn't qualified to do the work. And I, I really shouldn't have been doing it in the first place. But the intentions were good. The desires, all that stuff, the, the desire for a good outcome was there. Um, it was just poor execution. And so I was very lucky that the, the consequences weren't too severe. But uh, she does no longer trust me with laundry. So I will say that you know, I, I'm, I'm banned from that. Still interesting situation. Well, I mean, hearing you tell that story, I mean, it sounds to me, it, it did not tear at the fabric of your relationship even no. if it damaged the fabric of the sweater. And that's that's the, the same way with the laundry issue here. You know, it's it's maybe a flippant example to say that, but it's it, it it it's not a binary thing is what what it illustrates is that, you know, you okay. can look at the skills and it is a skills thing in some situation and and say, well, you know, in that area 
given those skills, you know, I I don't trust either of you to wash my sweaters now. Um, <laughs> right. Probably any of you. Um, but it doesn't mean that it impacted every area of trust in our lives. Right. You know, and that's, I think, what one of, one of the things I see happen is that people make it an on-off <clears throat> switch. Or in a kind of a related thing, they will label people as, you know, um, Susie is uh, unassertive and, you know, then kind of take her from that perspective and everything. Whereas Susie, you know, not a real person, might be completely assertive, appropriately assertive in some situations, but not in others. Um, so it, that whole thing about um, taking a dynamic process and putting someone into a static category um, gets in the way of a lot of relationships and gets in the way of trust. Because the trust that we have when we have it is in a context, is what you're saying. Yeah. So I think one of the reasons I'm reflecting on what I said earlier about how it came to be that I seem to trust by default, whether or not that's strategic, I didn't see this in myself, but my fiance did because her background is different. And one of the things she likes best about me, bless her heart, is, is how trusting I am of other people. Because the way that she attributed that is that I'm, I'm willing to let other people make their own decisions because, first of all, they're going to anyway. And second of all, because for me, myself, I've always been comfortable that no matter what the decision I'm faced with, I'll figure out how to handle it. And so I assume that other people will too in my naive, uh, small theory of mind <laughs> way of thinking. Uh, but so to her, that's endearing. And I wonder if there is a connection beyond what the two of us have seen that you two would talk to about the extent to which we can trust other people, uh, or if it's even meaningful to say that the way we trust ourselves is the same word, or is that a different idea entirely, or are they related? Because to me, it seems like a limiting factor for how much I can trust someone else is how much I trust myself. Well, that, that begs the question, what is this trust thing? You trust, you keep using that word. Mm -hmm. and, and so how do you define trust in a work relationship? Well, for me, it's about decisions. Uh, it's 100%. Can I give you, you know, a whole area of thoughts and context to think about and be convinced that you'll do the right thing in those situations? And you'll even, you'll be able to tell what you're getting into when you're getting into it. You'll know when the decisions are a little bit past you and you'll be able to see that as it's happening. Uh, you won't assume that washing cold and, <laughs> and <laughs> drying hot. hot is always correct. <laughs> you'll, you'll be able to tell what's at stake and whether you have what it takes to decide or whether you don't. And for me, that's so, a question... So, the question there, though, Amitai, would be when you say part of your trust uh, thought process would be to make the right decision, does that mean the decision that you would make? Or is that trusting people to make a logical? See, I struggle with this, too, because I, with my staff, I try to be very... So I, I see trust as a, can almost be wielded as a weapon. And the second you call someone untrustworthy, you've undercut them in the workplace. Absolutely. And so I... I try to be incredibly careful with how that's used because oftentimes when I find that when I feel initially, because the emotion will bubble first, that someone has violated my trust, I have probably given poor direction on uh, or on I have not clarified expectations. And so I try to take that approach. And if, I, if that approach still leads me to believe that trust has been violated, fine, then I figure out the next system or step that could have caused it. But typically... It's something within my own thinking or something in my own actions that could have led to or contributed. I think that's an important distinction as well. Absolutely. I mean, I think in a professional situation, we're looking at, do we trust um, someone's competence? Do they have the skills and the knowledge to do the job? Do we trust their intentions to the team? And do, they, do we trust their intentions towards us? So right. that's kind of the professional trust. But I see the situation you're describing a lot where someone, a manager, will give a fairly vague assignment. And then when it's not done the way they imagined it should be done, they lose trust when it was really there wasn't enough conversation to set context and to set constraints and to set boundaries. And then in that case, it's really unfair to, in my opinion, it's really unfair to um, withdraw your trust from someone. Because you were part of that transaction, right? You were part of the 
the setting of expectations. And so, yeah, and I, yeah. I took a pseudo swipe at Amitai, so I wanted to be able to answer it because it, it wasn't meant to be. But really, I struggle with um, when I when I look at the if they make the right decision or give the right answer, whether it's a logical, defendable, reasonable one, or if it's the one I would have given. And so I exactly. let me clarify that before you take that personally. Well, I did swipe uh, at your laundry skills, even though you <laughs> sort of invited us to. <laughs> but um, no, that's exactly right. I don't. If anything, when I when I trust someone with a decision, I kind of secretly hope they'll make a better one than I would. And something that helps me with sure. that is to, over time, painfully realize that what I think is right is not always right. <laughs> so yeah. going into the trust decision with that in mind. Uh, you know, if they if they considered the context carefully, if they looked for clues, if they got help from people that could help them, if they were conscientious about it, and if I, I'm pretty sure that I knew they were going to be conscientious about it, that's what I wanted. That's all I needed. Yeah, I think if you're always looking for someone to make the same decision you would make, that is um, not particularly healthy or helpful. Right. It, it's definitely a behavior to guard against. And it's, like I said, it's one that I try to be alert of. And, and I think it helps because then it shows that you, you're looking for diverse thought. You're looking for different answers. Right. You're not punishing people for trying to innovate or do something a little different. And, and it sounds like we all agree on that. Yeah, I think the missing step in that sort of delegation that I see a lot is that people make a lot of assumptions about what the givens are and what the constraints are, and they assume everybody else makes the same assumptions. Right. So, so I think it's helpful to be explicit about what the constraints are. I think, in general, in the workplace, uh, you know, trust would be higher if people were explicit about what the constraints are when they're delegating. But I think people also need to think through what would, what is the, you know, what are the things that are out of bounds. Because that's often when people come, you know, someone brings them a decision and they say, oh, no, absolutely not, not that, because it's something that they didn't articulate what some sort of constraint was, or think about some, the, the one thing they can't agree to. What are the outcomes we must not have? Uh, what are the variables yeah. that seem like you, you can control, but you can't control? Yeah. Where, where don't you go? Uh, I'm currently working with the, uh, a, a group of teams, there's 40 some odd teams in this division I'm working with. And when I work with scrum masters, uh, I'm, I'm more interested in what are they thinking and are they making decisions that they can explain, this is how I got here. There's, right. In software development, just developing software alone, there's multiple ways to develop any piece of functionality. So there might be some that are better than some that are worse, but there's multiple ways of getting to the end. So once you elevate that, now you start talking about trust and working with teams and people, there's an infinite number of possible outcomes and an infinite number of ways to get to those infinite number of outcomes. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what they're thinking. Uh, I was talking with one scrum master who had visited another team, and he said, well, I noticed that the scrum master and the other team didn't, walk, uh, didn't use the electronic tool during the stand-up. And I said... Well, is that wrong? I would have said, oh, thank God. <laughs> um, but, you know, and then he, then we had a conversation. And this one first Scrum Master likes the very ordered, logical approach to see how the stories are progressing and, and, and uses the tool to do that. And the other one has a more informal talk around the room. And if you don't know exactly what, people are working on, you have no clue where the story is. So the, you brought up an interesting thing, Don, because requiring that pe people be able to justify their decision is is a tricky thing because very often, I mean, there's a lot of research about this, is people decide things and then they come up with a rationale for it afterwards. Makes uh, sense so to that, me. That's part of it. And there's there's also... A phenomena where if people have a certain level of ex expertise and they are pattern matchers, they may not know how they got there, right? I remember when I was um, 
doing production support and there would be some problem that was going on and I would look around a few things for a while and then I'd say, you know, it's not here, it's way over there. That's the source of the problem. And if someone had asked me, well, how did you how did you make that logical leap from there? How did you make that decision? Um, I, I would not have been able to tell them. I just kind of knew, you know, holding other people up to a test of saying, you know, you have to be able to to describe how you reach this decision. Yeah. I, I don't know if that takes us down a useful flat path or not. I think it depends on the openness and trust in the environment, or if people can actually talk freely about the, the reasonable or the reasoning behind their decision. But I also, I, I totally get what you're saying there with, you know, my decision making is more intuitive and, and for better or for worse, I can't always explain how I got to a conclusion. Uh, kind of like back in school with math. Uh, I could look at a math problem and solve it, but if you asked me to show my work half the time, it was not going to happen. And so I, I typically found myself in trouble with teachers because intuitively I could understand how a problem worked, but I, but as far as the mechanics of getting there, not always explainable. And that could either, some teachers were fine with it, others were negative about it. And I wonder if that's kind of the playing out uh, your concern there as well, Esther. Yeah. So, did you you know if do you trust the person who comes up with the the right answer to the math problem but can't show their work? If they do it consistently, I probably do. On the scrum master topic, with uh, with trust fascinates me. I love this aspect of it because the the scrum master role to me is incredibly difficult. They think it's. I think most people look at it as manage the the rules of Scrum, but what I find is we're actually playing and operating in the spaces between the roles. So what I mean by that is we're the the support and confidant of the product owner. We are providing feedback to stakeholders. We're working with the team on, on in a coaching capacity and a listening capacity, and so we're all about relationships and trust. And a Scrum master who does not gain trust seems to be dead to me as far as in their role? I don't know how you could function as a scrum master without the trust of the team. Um, or without trusting the team. Or without trusting right. the team. is you've got one shot, you, you goof up trust one time, you're done. It just seems so foundational to the role of the scrum master that, that to not put trust almost at the top of almost at front of mind whenever you're doing anything like could this tarnish trust could this gain or remove trust am i trusting the team am i trusting myself to guide the team um it just seems like you're just setting yourself up for yeah. failure at the outset i think there's a handful of things that people do to that build trust i mean one is the thing we mentioned before about trusting other people that's uh, that's really key, and it's always bounded and contextual. It's like you don't trust them with your bank account, you know, the first day you meet them. Um, that would be <laughs> foolish. Um, but bring up bring up issues directly. Um, so if you have an issue with someone, bring it up directly with them rather than going to a third party. Sorry, dog's barking again. So, um, you know, rather than going to your scrum master or manager, bring it up with the person directly. That's a, That has a huge impact on trust or breaking trust. If people feel like, you know, if you've got a problem with me, you're going to be talking to everybody else on the team but me with it. Um, I think sharing information is critical. Um, and saying no when you mean no. Instead of saying, yes, I'll do it, even when you know you can't get to something. Or let people know as soon as you find out. And share what you know and what you don't know. Um, which is a hard one in our um, business culture where, you know, it's more acceptable to be certain and confident and wrong than to say, I don't know that. But I think those are just a handful of things that... Um, people on teams can do that will build up trust on the team. I took a, a great scrum class with Joe Little out in uh, in North Carolina, and his he kept saying over and over and over, and and I couldn't understand at the time, but I totally get it now. Is over and over and, and over he would say, "Bad news does not get better with age," <laughs> and uh, that's true. Just 
constantly repeating it. And finally, you know, one night after the class, I just kind of talked to him. We had this very long conversation, kept him way too long. And it all came down to trust. And it's he, and for him, it was just people who are willing to give bad news or admit they don't know something quickly and upfront, all the trust in the world as far as the, the work relationship goes. But those who will let bad news get older, even though it doesn't get better, it just diminishes that uh, over and over and over. So One thing a manager can do to make sure that the bad news ages is to say, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. I right. hate that phrase. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, that, that just communicates that. I mean, people don't bring problems they know how to solve unless the, all the initiative has been beat out of them. But yeah, that's a great way to make sure you don't find out about stuff till it's a really a big, bad problem. And it's really revealing when the manager says that of their entire theory of how people and work work. Yeah. I think that's part of why it's so frustrating for me when I run into that is I realize, yeah. oh, this is what I'm up against. Okay. It's a poor comment to make to people who are being vulnerable enough to ask you for help. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it, out of respect for them, it's just a, it's a bad thing to say. I know that when I'm faced with, when they have a problem, my, my first question is, how far did you get? And just trying to see the steps initially to try to shake out ideas, but never uh, expecting a solution to come with a problem. Because if that were the case, I would kind of wonder why they were bringing it to me in the first place. Because I, I trust them to take care of the problems they know how to solve. I think, well, I think why managers say things like that, going back to the idea that, you know, people have good intentions. I think they've been taught to say that. Sure. And I think they also are afraid of getting stuck with all the problems themselves, which there, which I get completely, right? But helping someone solve something is not the same as getting stuck with it yourself. A gentleman who's written on this quite a bit too, uh, Ron Lichty, who published uh, Managing the Unmanageable. And, and his, uh, he actually has some thoughts on this particular statement. And what he came back to and what he asks during his talks is, you know, of all the managers in the in the room, how many of you have had more than two days uh, straight of training on how to be a manager? And he says, maybe in a room of 100, four or five will raise their hand. And so a lot of the behaviors, it's just learned behavior, as I, as I think you were saying, Esther, that, you know, that manager, they had a manager early on who said that, that comments, you know, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. And it's just kind of learned and handed down because on the at a very shallow level, it sounds clever. Yeah. It's like, I'm proactive. Not only do I want your problems, not only am I going to help you, but I need your solutions. And, but at, at the root of it, it really is a destructive statement. But if you don't know any better, yeah. you know, perhaps you think it is a benevolent comment. And you may have a manager, if you're in the middle somewhere, who said that to you, in which case you're stuck with all the problems and can't bring them to him or her. <laughs> Yeah, definitely agree. It's such a, it can, and, and that gets back to, I think, you know, the, the core comment and, and one of the themes of this discussion is that it's so contextual that uh, every situation where you're building or destroying trust is, is based on a certain context, a certain situation, and uh, the way that we handle it is so important. That's a phrase that will break trust. A- absolutely. Well, as I look at, um, I look at the clock, I think we're in we're in some danger of breaking the trust that we, we have with you, Esther, as far as when we told you we would let you go. Well, it's not me so much it's as it's dinner. Gotcha. And we don't want to keep you from that. No. So at this point of the show, we usually, and we like to ask our guests if there's anything that they would like to promote, anything they have going on. We are, of course, going to leave links to your two books, uh, The Retrospectives book and Behind Closed Doors oh, in the show you. notes. Thanks. Those are... Mandatory reading, in my opinion, for managers and, and scrum teams and agile teams. The retrospective book is the gold standard on how you conduct a retrospective. If you are doing scrum and agile and you do retrospectives and you haven't read the book, uh, you're not doing it right. So check that book out in the show notes. Click the link. Check it out. But Esther, is there anything else you have going on that you would like to uh, bring to the attention of our listeners? Well, um, John and I do a class together called Coaching Beyond the Team. Um, so I don't know if this is going to be posted in time for people to come to the next one, which is October 19th and 20th. Uh, but, uh, we will be scheduling classes in the future 
And it's a great class for scrum masters, team leads, managers, people who need to work with other people to accomplish goals and organizations. And it's it, it, it talks a lot about building rapport and gaining trust um, and then helping people engage in joint problem solving. Coachingbeyondtheteam.com. We will get that in the show notes for you. Great. Don, what do you have going on aside from Coaching Beyond the Team that you'd like our listeners to be aware of? <laughs> well, last week I presented Atlanta Scrum, but I don't think you can get this posted before that. <laughs> Well, I am Noah. I I was at Scrum Day Twin Cities. <laughs> and we can fix it in pre. Before that, either. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fix it in pre. <laughs> <laughs> Very so, good. So that's pretty much what I've got going is uh, the coaching beyond the team workshop with Esther right now, Mr. Schleier. Well, uh, as someone who has attended a workshop that Esther put on with Jerry. Weinberg, uh, I can say if I could go to Coaching Beyond the Team, I would be there. Mm. Uh, it's definitely right in my wheelhouse for what I'm doing right now. Uh, just the timing and the, the situation is not perfect, but it's because I will be at the Toronto Agile Conference on the 20th of, of October oh. for a mini reunion with several of my PSL classmates. Oh, that's wonderful. Would you say hello to them for me? I certainly would will. Would you greet them for me? Thank you. With pleasure. Yeah. And yeah, so for the listeners, PSL is the problem solving leadership class that Esther does with Jerry Weinberg. I've only heard amazing things about it. And so we'll also get a link up to PSL in case you're interested in learning more about that. Yeah, we and, are, Jerry and I are talking about 2016 classes at this point. We're done for this year, but we're talking about 2016. So it seems like every time I'm on the show, I talk about Agile in three minutes. There are three particular episodes that I think are on topic for what we covered tonight. There are episodes three, four, and five on trust, intuit, and wrong. And that's about uh, the role of judgment and decisions, about trust itself, and uh, the necessity of making it comfortable and even enjoyable to be wrong. And the key reason that I'm flogging it today is that Agile in three minutes, now that it's up to episode 22, is finally on iTunes. I finally got around to it. So it'll be a lot easier to find and subscribe. Uh, leave a review if you feel so inclined. Listen and enjoy. Can I also mention a book? Please. Um, Solomon and Flores um, have a book on trust. And I probably won't get the title exactly right, but it's a fantastic book. It's really um, interesting. I will look it up and get it in the show notes. Great. Uh, if you're not listening to Agile in three minutes, I mean, who doesn't have three minutes, right? I mean, you have three minutes, and it. Uh, a number of his episodes have left me thinking quite a bit throughout the rest of the day. And so it leads to, um, it really stretches your brain. It's really enjoyable. If you're not listening, what's wrong with you? And I hope you uh, check out Amitai's uh, Agile in Three Minutes. And I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Thank you for listening tonight. The, uh, the numbers this month have just been phenomenal. Uh, it's just humbling uh, how many of you are listening, sharing the podcast, Amitai, you and I have gotten some amazing uh, tweets this week, along with Zach Boniker. The, the the feedback is just uh, it's just humbling to to know that uh, that people are getting value, that they're telling us they're getting value out of the podcast. It's I cannot thank the listeners enough. And so I'm not plugging anything this week. I'm just uh, grateful that you're here. I'm grateful that you're listening, and uh, I hope that we continue to bring value to your lives. That's it for this episode of Agile for Humans. Don, Esther, Amitai, thanks for joining in. I love this topic, and I hope we have many more talks about trust in the future. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com.